President Lincoln is best known for ending slavery, but he also ushered in a new era. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. 1860 turned out to be a pivotal moment in American history. It saw not only the beginning of the end of slavery, but also the groundwork for a new industrial nation. David Reynolds has authored a new book entitled Abe, Abraham Lincoln in His Times, which traces the cultural changes as well as the political that shaped the man we now know as the great emancipator. And we have him on the phone this morning. Welcome to the program. Nice to be here, Don. Thank you. So give me a sense, by the way, about the cultural and political milieu in which he uh, enters uh, certainly public life, uh, and you describe it as the Puritans or Roundheads from Cromwell, as opposed to the Cavaliers. Yeah, uh, the, the North, the anti-slavery people in the North uh, kind of uh, trace themselves ideologically back to the Puritans and people like Cromwell who were kind of fighting uh, for human rights and so forth um, in, in Great Britain, and also uh, the early American, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mayflower people and so forth, as opposed to the Cavaliers, who were the Southern people, who were steeped in uh, tradition and honor, and also they believed in hierarchy, which is why they endorsed slavery in, in part. Uh, and uh, so uh, there was this kind of cultural uh, background uh, of North versus South, and people at that time a lot of times said, uh, well, uh, it's really a, a war about the Puritan versus the Cavalier. And the thing about Lincoln is that on his father's side, he was traced back to Puritan, Puritan New England, Samuel Lincoln, who came over in 1637. And on his mother's side, um, uh, he, he traced back to Virginia and a kind of planter, a southern planter. So uh, some people viewed him as kind of the combination of the Puritan and the, ca and the Cavalier, and that he had both the Cavalier sense of honor and all of that, but a long time the kind of moral, uh, the moral commitment and the devotion to human rights um, that came from the Puritan Revolution of the 1640s and uh, um, the kind of uh, separatists who came over to America and settled America and rebelled against the hierarchy of the Anglican Church in um, in Eng England at the time. So uh, people were, you know, looked at him and saw him as, as kind of a combination uh, of the two. Now, does that then indicate sort of his balancing act that he seems to do uh, in terms of uh, the pro-slavery versus anti-slavery and this perhaps even a balancing between the two cultures, as it were? Yeah, he compared himself to the most famous tightrope walker of his era named Blondin, Charles Blondin, who in 1859 made many crossings of Ni Niagara Falls, sometimes with a man on his back, sometimes uh, pushing a wheelbarrow. This was without a net, of course. It's about 1,200 feet across Niagara Falls. And um, Lincoln uh, compared himself compared himself several times to Blondin, as did many other people, uh, cartoonists and every, everything of, of his day, because uh, as much as he hated slavery, and personally he was close to African Americans and everything, but he knew that he, he didn't want to inflame cultural hostilities even further. And this is why he kind of positioned himself as Blondin, because he knew that in a very divided time, the worst thing you can do is to play to a political base. You have to, uh, in his words, have malice toward none and charity to all. So in terms of his relationship to slavery, how do you see him then navigating this? Because he doesn't come out and say that he opposes um, slavery in the sense of repealing it. But on the other hand, he talks about uh, the idea of not its expansion, being against its expansion. Uh, and he ultimately, obviously, uh, becomes a great emancipator. Describe that arc for me. Oh, sure. Well, at the beginning of the war, he said, or before the Civil War, which begins in 1861, he said, we're, we're willing to, we Republicans, back, when, back then the Republicans were the liberals, and the Democrats were the conservatives. And he said, we, you know, we're willing to leave slavery where it is because the Constitution... Uh, says the federal government can't really interfere with slavery, but we don't want it to expand into the federal territories in the um, uh, in in the West. There were many open territories at that time, 
And uh, he and fellow Republicans thought that by containing slavery where it was, that eventually it would die off almost like rotting fruit off of a, a, a vine. But if it was allowed to spread, well, back then the Democrats and the Southerners, who were the conservatives, really had visions of taking over the West and also uh, taking over Cuba and Mexico, and slavery would have gone crazy if it was allowed to expand. So uh, uh, he was very firm, though, about uh, forbidding its expansion, and he was, when he was president, uh, he that's why he took up arms against the South when the South attacked Fort Sumter, started the Civil War. He called up troops, and there was four years of Civil War. 750,000 Americans died, and he opposed slavery as much as any abolitionist, but he had this kind of moderate public stance stance because he didn't really want to inflame. There were a lot of uh, anti-Lincoln people in the North. He didn't want to inflame the, the hostilities there. And he also wanted to keep the border states. There were five states that were uh, that held slaves, Kentucky and Tennessee and Maryland and so forth, uh, and yet remained with the North. But he said, you know, if we lose Kentucky, we'll lose everything. If Kentucky goes with us, and they, they're trembling on the edge. If he, if he was uncautious about things, uh, several of these states could have easily tumbled into the South, and then they, uh, the North would have lost the Civil War. So uh, by the end, and he realized that uh, the North was going to win the war uh, in, in uh, late by September uh, of 1864, uh, he really was driving now toward emancipation. He had already uh, issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and he was pu pushing hard for the uh, 13th Amendment, uh, which is uh, the subject of Spielberg's movie, um, uh, Lincoln, about the passage of the uh, amendment that abolished slavery. And Lincoln, toward the end, was very much pushing for emancipation by that time. So one of the things he suggests, I think he was questioned as to how long slavery might last, this before the Civil War, and he suggested it could be 50 to 100 years. Um, it seems to me that he saw it maybe dying out, but he certainly had a long time frame. Yeah, a lot of people were wondering how long it would take. Some people said 25 years. Some, you know, he said it could be a, a century. If you can imagine, if you can imagine slavery around in 1958, he said that in 1858. Um, but he was just talking about the sheer electoral process. You know, if you just went through election, 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 and at the time he said that. The elections were very much dominated by um, the Southern Democrats, by, by slaveholders. Uh, Twelve American presidents owned slaves, and most um, Supreme Court justices owned slaves. I mean, it was largely a pro-slavery system, so he had to envisage uh, the disappearance of this political powerhouse of slavery. And he said, well, it could take 50 years, it could take 100 years, but I just wanted to leave. At that time, he wasn't thinking about civil war, about civil war. I want to turn to um, his three uh, major addresses, which is first inaugural, which seems to be uh, one in which he tries to certainly uh, extend some kind of um, reaching hand to the South. The Gettysburg Request address talks about equality. Uh, but in the end, as you mentioned a moment ago, in the second inaugural, uh, not only does he denounce slavery, but he, he says, and as you point out, malice toward none, charity to all. But then he goes on to say, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. In other words, he seems to be going saying, yes, we're going to do these things, but there's also an issue of being right. Yeah, and he always thought that there was a right and a wrong about slavery. Uh, it was right that slavery should be abolished. It was wrong to support slavery. But in the second inaugural, he actually uses that word uh, very forcefully and says that we have to go forward uh, uh, toward human justice, toward progress. Uh, we can't go backward into slavery. And uh, he would have been appalled by what happened during Jim Crow later on when there was segregation and discrimination and all that. So, uh, But he, he did lay the groundwork for human rights by supporting the 13th Amendment and by uh, waging the war that ended slavery in America. Uh, and then uh, after his death, there was the 14th Amendment, and then the 15th Amendment, which gave uh, voting rights and citizenship to African-American males, women would come later in 1920. But uh, 
And the point is that he wanted to always progress toward human rights and toward justice. One of the things, by the way, you point out is that he really begins what may be a modern industrial era with a government, strong government action, federal action from agriculture department to banking and so on. Describe a little bit about that, because it seems as if the Civil War in his particular period really begins what could be the, the nascent uh, moment of uh, the progressive uh, era. Yeah, he envisaged, um, he had a, a, a very expansive view of the government. He thought that the government should actually do uh, everything that, um, you know, normal people could just, just are powerless to do, um, uh, that the government should be, be there for them. And when he supported the Homestead Act in 1862, he was literally giving away many, many acres to um, thousands and it turned out millions of people almost for free, almost for free. These were Western acres, Western homesteads. And... Um, the uh, uh, the monetary system he uh, wanted to stabilize it, uh, and that's why he authorized greenbacks, which were the ancestor of the dollar, because there were uh, American currencies were produced by states, and there were all these different states, and they were, they were all so he centralized banking, and he wanted a very expansive government that would really help average Americans. Finally, in terms of that cultural divide that uh, we started out with, it seems as if certainly he eliminated slavery, uh, but that cultural divide continued on certainly into Jim Crow, and I was curious about whether or not you see that continuing on even into our own era. It goes in waves. Just after he died, um, African Americans made a big, um, big progress down in the South, but then Fairly quickly, there was a reaction. This was during Reconstruction, and white supremacy raised its ugly head again. And uh, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, gave rise to Jim Crow in the 1880s all the way up to 1954, when there was lynching of uh, black people and legalized segregation. Then you had the civil rights movement of the late 18, uh, 1950s and the 1960s, and Martin Luther King and, and, and uh, the civil rights movement. But then you had the rise of kind of a right-wing uh, conservatism uh, that kind of lasts, lasts until uh, today, until today. And that's why you have such huge uh, uh, political and cultural divisions uh, in our era. Just briefly, do you think then that uh, the current President Donald Trump then represents that, that divide? Yeah, uh, he's very, un very much unlike Lincoln. He likes to compare himself to Lincoln, but he's not at all like Lincoln. Lincoln did not play to a political base. Did not, he, he, he thought the worst thing you could do is to pour gasoline on the flame of, of divisions. And he didn't even call out his political enemies uh, uh, in, in any kind of ad hominem or, or in a kind of nasty way whatsoever. He just affirmed uh, what he thought was right and just for all people. And he really did have charity for all. We've been speaking with David Reynolds. He's uh, authored a new book entitled Abe, Abraham Lincoln in His Times, which traces the cultural changes as well as the political that has shaped the man we now know as the great emancipator. We appreciate you taking the time to talk with us this morning. Thank you very much, Don. Appreciate it. This has been Delmarva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening.